Hi, my name is Rich Casarino. I'm the new creative director here at New Brighton United Methodist Church, and I'm happy to bring you this week's announcements. New Brighton UMC will be hosting a blood drive on Tuesday, September 28th from 1.30 to 6.30 p.m. Do your part in helping others by donating life-saving blood. Reservations need to be made by calling 1-800-RED-CROSS or visiting redcrossblood.org. Attention parents, New Brighton United Methodist Church is proud to introduce our newest children's ministry, Little Lambs. Little Lambs is a faith-based playtime for children ages 18 months through 3 years old. You and your little ones will have a blast playing games, singing songs, listening to stories, and much more. Join us on Wednesdays from 10 to 11 a.m. For more information on Little Lambs, visit us online at nbumchurch.org. Grab a friend and get ready to eat at the Just Older Youth Luncheon, Wednesday, October 6th at noon. Reservations are suggested, so please sign up at any of the church entrances or call the church at 724-843-3774 or send an email to nbumc.secretary at yahoo.com. Faith Journey is back. Join us at 10 a.m. every Sunday in the Church Cafe as we dig into our new study on The Call by Adam Hamilton. To pick up your book, stop by the church office or simply show up at 10 a.m. in the church cafe. Let's raise a joyful noise to the Lord. Tuesday Tunes is a half hour of worship, music, and prayer with our Director of Music Ministries, David Wolbert. Join us live on Facebook every Tuesday at 6 p.m. for Tuesday Tunes. For more information on these and all of our other church happenings, please be sure to visit us online at nbumchurch.org. All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started with a song called Open the Eye Heart. So let's, let's rise up together and sing together. Here we go. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart.
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, merciful God, we uh, come before you this day, and what a beautiful day it is outside. What a beautiful day it is uh, to just uh, experience you, experience the beauty of this day, experience, uh, Lord, your presence in our lives. And Lord, we are thankful for you being a part of our lives, Lord. We're thankful for your truth. We're thankful, Lord, for the way in which you uh, give us strength when we are weak, the way in which, Lord, you uh, lift us up when we are down. And for these things, Lord, we just honor you and praise you. You care for us, Lord, even when we turn from you. When we are uh, relying upon our own wills, you are always there, Lord, to compel us to turn away from ourselves and our own interests and just focus all of our attention back on you. So grant us, Lord, this day the wisdom to turn to you each day as individuals and as a church, depending always on your power and your truth rather than our own powers and the deceptive truths of this world. Lord, help us, Lord, to understand that it is only through utter dependence upon you that we will be saved from the sinful world, from our sinful selves, and that the purpose, Lord, of our salvation is so that we can gaze beyond our own salvation and also help others on the path of their salvation. And so with this, Lord, we Humbly ask for your wisdom and the responsibility that we all bear as followers, as disciples, as we gather together. And we also lift up to you those that are uh, hurting this day, those in our bulletin, those that are connected to this church, and those, Lord, who we uh, don't know by name, uh, who may be watching today, or uh, those that are on our hearts. Lord, we ask you to care for them in a time of need. Give those mentioned as well as those that we haven't mentioned, Lord, the assurance of your ever-present power, your ever-present care, your ever-present mercy, Lord, in the situations or the struggles in which they find themselves. And just, Lord, allow them the ability to experience your eternal comfort and love this day as exemplified in your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we're going to sing one of the classic, a couple of hymns here. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and we'll go into amazing grace. So let's sing this out together. Oh, so.
The scripture reading for today comes from uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, no, we don't preach on Revelation much, but this is uh, Revelation chapter 7, uh, verses 9 uh, through 17. Uh, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. This is the reading of the Lord. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? Said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship Him day and night within His temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. 
They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, come into this time of Word. Uh, Open our hearts, Lord, as your children. Open our minds and allow your Holy Word and your presence in us, Lord, in such a way so that we may experience your love and your comfort and your care. Use only your words here today, Lord, and not my own. In Jesus' name, amen. If you wanted to uh, really get a, a picture of the mission of the church, or maybe the, the um, uh, maybe not even the mission, but just the goal of the church, which I guess could be the mission, uh, you can find sort of a complete definition right here in this little brief part of Revelation 7. The mission of the church is to, as Revelation 7 puts it, gathers all people from every nation, from every race, from every language. That means all people that are made in the image of God, as made of divine worth, created by God. So that's all people in the world. They are all gathered together under the Lamb, who is Jesus. We know Jesus is the Lamb of God, to drink the living waters, to be transformed by Jesus and then to uh, drink the living waters or to um, become a disciple and then to go out into the world and wipe away every tear. So the mission of the church is gather all people under the Lamb to become disciples of the Lamb and then go out and wipe away tears uh, to spread the message, to bring peace and comfort and uh, bring peace to where there is struggle, those sorts of things, to go out and do mission type work. An early church tradition from clear back in the second century attributes this writing in Revelation to the Apostle John, who later in his life, he was dreaming these dreams and having visions uh, that were coming to him from God while he was in prison on the island of Patmos. John recorded these visions for the church that was at the time you see, suffering this great persecution, and many were dying because of their faith in Jesus. And this vision from Revelation 7 that God gives to John and to the suffering church at the time is a vision of really not just what they should do, but also a celebration that is taking place in the heavens. God gives the suffering church a vision of a a party that is going on in heaven, a celebration with Jesus the Lamb, with angels, and those, as Scripture says in verse 14, have gone through what is known as the great ordeal. And what is meant by this is that they are those who have gone through great struggle, suffering through pain, Uh, And now they find themselves in heaven with God and Jesus and angels and all of this great stuff. And there's singing going on where there is no more suffering, no more pain, no more hunger and no more tears. So you see what God is giving to John is a vision of hope to get them through a very tough time in which they are being persecuted, a vision that helps keep the church focused on these rewards of the future through the suffering in which they are enduring in the present. One of my uh, greatest fears as as a person is uh, being all alone, uh, maybe in the middle of a body of water, like out in the middle of the ocean. That's really one of my greatest fears. I can't think of anything more torturous than uh, being lost in the middle of the ocean uh, with no land in sight. I remember this one time uh, when I was a teenager, I was talked into going water skiing uh, in the Ohio River. Now I am fully aware 
the, the Ohio River is not in the middle of the ocean, but you couldn't get me in the middle of the ocean, but you could get me in the Ohio River. Uh, but if you get out in the middle of that Ohio River, uh, it can seem kind of far from shore. I don't know how many of you have been on a boat out there, but it can kind of feel a little far from shore. Anyway, my skiing experience at that time was very limited, meaning that I had never once done it. Okay. Uh, but I was talked into it. I really didn't fear the river at first when I got in. I mean, I had a life jet vest on. Uh, I could see the shore. I knew that how to get there if I really had to. The fear I really had to overcome at that time was, you know, because this is in the 80s, you know, swimming around all the garbage that was floating down the Ohio River and the cancer-causing stuff that was, that was on the river at that time, at that time. And all these weird, creepy things that would like kind of swim by your legs and brush your legs. It just kind of, that was really my fear at the time. You know, the, didn't know what hideously deformed, chemically morphed creatures were swimming underneath those waters. Uh, but if you've ever fished the Ohio River, you know you pull out fish that you don't know what is going on with them. So you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, other than that, my skiing day... Uh, wasn't that bad at first. You know, I got up on the skis. They say that's the hardest part, just getting up on them. I got up on the skis and I'm cruising around and I'm thinking I'm doing really good. You know, you're going pretty fast. I start moving to one side and to the other. And then the boat has to turn around in the river. Have you ever uh, been on skis when the boat turns around? Well, you hit the wake of the boat and you start jumping, right? Well, I was not prepared for this. No one told me about this. And so I hit one of these wakes and I just launched forward. And I did one of these like double flips in the air and I crashed down uh, into the water with this tremendous force. Thank goodness I had a life vest on because when you hit the water upside down, uh, you become very disoriented. Right? But the life vest helped me and, I, and it just popped me up out of the water. I remember coming up out of the water and all of a sudden I got scared. I really, like I said, I was disoriented and I couldn't see the shore. Right? And I didn't know where the boat was. And uh, so I was uh, in the middle of this, it felt like this very vast ocean. Uh, I had no sense of direction. I didn't know what was ahead of me. I didn't know what was behind me. I was in the midst of the water, right? I was in the midst of it and I couldn't find my way out. Looking back, I probably had a concussion or something. Uh, but the point is that sometimes in life, we get caught up in the midst of it. We get caught up in the midst of our daily struggles, we get caught up in the midst of our daily fears that we might have, or maybe the daily pains that we are going through, or maybe even our daily worries. Uh, and we just get caught up in all of that, that we have trouble seeing the future. We have trouble seeing the promises of God, or we have trouble seeing the safety of the shore. And such was the case in the time in which John wrote this Revelation 7. The church was in the midst of it. People were dying horrifically because of their belief, and they needed this vision to help give them their bearings once again. As Christians living today, we also live in the middle of trouble. Okay? It's like we are in the middle of the ocean and we can't see the shore. You see, we live in what's known as this middle time. It's the in-between time. We live in the time after the resurrection, but the time before the second coming of Christ. This is the middle time. And in this middle time, it's subjected to all of the same pain and the same suffering and famine and tears and wars and days like we had last Saturday when we... Uh, honored the 20th anniversary of September 11th, you know, days in which we mourn the loss of God's created who have died because of the fallenness of this world. 
this middle time is subject to all of these things. And in this middle time, when we look at our world and we see all of this bad stuff going on, it sometimes becomes hard for us to see the shore, right? We begin to drift in the middle and we start to think that this world in which we experience will never end. And we just sort of float out there treading water, just feeling like this suffering that we and others are enduring is the way that it will always be. We think there will always be Herods. We think there will always be Hitlers and 9-11s and ISIS and people just hating each other, doing evil things. It never seems like all of this bad, sinful stuff will end. So we might as well just sit here in the middle and let it happen. However, as we are drifting along, Revelation 7 comes to us. And it gives us this beautiful glimpse into heaven. And suddenly, we kind of see the shore again. And on that shore, there is healing for us. And there is healing for the lives of our loved ones. But even more, heaven is also a place where all of the injustices of this world will finally be made right, will be reconciled. And all of those that have endured trials will one day be with Jesus, be with angels, be with elders and others. And there will be singing and a party happening in heaven. You see, that is what is different about Christianity. At its very heart is a message of hope. At its very heart is that because of Christ coming to our world, all the bad stuff that any of us has ever experienced will one day come to an end. Tears will end for everyone. Not that you won't remember all the bad stuff, but it will be so redeemed and so joyous that you will never cry over it again. That is a complete and total redeeming. Therefore, the Christian church looks into this present time, this middle time in which we all experience pain, and we see it in light of this future that's spoken about in Revelation 7. The church looks at the time that we are living in now and declares, because we have glimpsed this future through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the coming Spirit into the world, because God through Jesus Christ has begun this redemption for all of us, we are therefore given hope. We don't need to wait around to celebrate for the celebration to begin. We as a church got to reach out into that suffering world and begin that celebration now. Having seen a glimpse of what God has in mind for the future of the world, we haven't got to wait for that world to come to its fullness in order to begin living in it right away. We can start living into that celebratory world right now. We don't have to wait to make sure that there's no more suffering from famine in other nations. Jesus and His power is with us. The church works to end it. We don't need to wait until little ones have clean drinking water all around the world. Jesus and His power is with us. Therefore, the church needs to work to end it. We don't have to wait until all the wars are gone and people stop spreading violence because Jesus and His power is with us today. The church needs to work to end it. We work to end all of this. No matter what the cost is to us, no matter what the price is to us, and sometimes no matter what the sacrifice is to each and every one of us, we do it because we know the truth that at the end of it all, one day that end will come and there's going to be a party when it does. The vision, the hope, the truth, suffering is temporary. Joy is eternal. That's it. There's a modern cathedral in England that features one whole wall made of glass. Do you have that picture? It's, it's, a, it's kind of hard to see on this small television, but this is a modern cathedral in England, and there's a wall made of glass here. And etched into that glass are these huge figures of saints and angels. Uh, So in those glass panes are etchings of these saints and angels. The etching is an image of saints and angels that are having a party. It's a Revelation 7 image. 
the saints and angels are there blowing trumpets and singing and making merry, you know, swinging from the chandeliers and just sort of dancing across the wall of glass. And if that were the only thing you saw when looking at the glass wall, you might conclude that there's something taunting about this, about such fun going on in heaven while there's so much suffering here taking place on earth. You might look at that wall and ask yourself, how could the church construct such a thing in this middle time when there are starving children and wars and death and terrorism and calamity and a growing gap between uh, people, people hating each other and not unified in any way. You might look at that glass wall and wonder why God would throw a party like that in times like these. And what sort of church would promote such a thing? That cathedral is located in a place called Coventry, England, and that makes all the difference in the world if you know the history of Coventry. For in November 1940, Coventry suffered the longest air raid endured in any one night by any city in England during all of World War II. It was an air raid which killed thousands and destroyed and reduced the entire city to nothing but rubble, including this cathedral. These people that built this church know suffering like few of us do. When they chose to rebuild the new cathedral, they chose to build it with the theme, Resurrection Through Sacrifice. So to look through that modern glass wall beyond all the dancing saints in heaven, one can see the painful ruins of the old bombed out church. If you look through that wall, you can hardly see it, but the old bombed out church is behind it just the way it was on the night in 1940. The rubble of those ruins that so symbolized life in the middle time cannot be seen through the glass wall except in the light of these dancing saints. It is a vision of promise that God gathers up all of our flawed history, all of its pain and all of its suffering and all of its war and all of its famine and anything else that sin can do to us and to others. He gathers it all up. He takes it away. And then he celebrates. God in Revelation 7 gave us all a great gift. He pulled back the curtain that obscured our vision of the shore because of the suffering that we all have endured and showed us a party that was going on in heaven. A party of people who, like all of us, had endured the great ordeal. As verse 14 states, they had borne the cross of faithful living in the middle time and now vindicated by God were in heaven praising and glorifying and celebrating God's holy name, which was God's way of saying to them and to us, have courage, brothers and sisters, you who bear the ministry of the cross. It's hard, I know, but you are moving toward the shore in triumph because of your faith your love for others, and your sacrifice for the stranger. Because you still believe in me, even while you have endured so much, there's going to be a party one day, and every one of you is going to be invited to it. Glory be to the Lord our God, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us a great vision of hope. Lord, allow us to feel that vision deep in our souls. Allow us to see it, Lord. Allow us to hold on to it. Allow it, Lord, to wash over us so that we can focus on you, Lord, in the midst of all of the pain in which we have endured and do endure. Allow us, Lord, to see that one day uh, all will be made right and peace and love and your glory will reign. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us rise for our closing song.
stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand again and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand again what could stand Sing out, our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God, in communion with the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep all of you, now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Brothers and sisters, go in peace.